tips and also ways that we can get. Oh, thank you. Um, also learn about different ways that we can um, do more, take more actions both within our community and at our congregation. So to get us started this evening, I just kind of want to run through a little bit about what's what's going on as um, we're all probably experts these days on how to operate Zoom. Just would ask yourself to please keep yourself muted during the presentations this evening. We'll be watching a short film and then we've got three speakers who will be sharing some information with us. Um, if you need any assistance during the program, if you could just type in the chat, we'll be monitoring the chat and we can reach out and help you. Um, or if you have any questions or things like that, you can place those in the chat as well so we don't forget about them and we'll be sure to go through the chat when we get to the Q&A and make sure we get to your questions. Um, lastly, as you just heard, we're going to be recording this session so that we can make it available to folks who weren't either able to attend or want to watch it later. So if you don't want to be on the recording, feel free to turn your video off. Um, you can ask your questions. If you have questions and you don't want to be in the recording, you can simply ask those in the chat and we'll, we'll record um, and we'll get those questions to our speakers. Went backwards. Um, so for tonight's program, I wanted to just do a little bit of an introduction to Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake, which is the organization that I work for, as well as the One Water Partnership Program, um, which is the program that's hosting and sponsoring this. Um, we'd like to do a land acknowledgement uh, and recognize that the land um, that we're all living and breathing and working on, um, the hands that it's passed through over time. Um, we have an opening reflection and prayer from uh, Gurdi Pura. Um, we're really excited to have join us. We've got a film that we'll watch, about a 25 minute film, um, and then we'll dive into our panelists who have some really interesting perspectives on pollinators and incorporating them into our landscaping practices. Finally, we'll end with a Q&A. Um, so hopefully we'll have some robust conversation. We'll have lots of opportunities um, for folks to ask their questions um, for the program. Um, so we'll get started. So who is Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake? I know there's a lot of familiar faces on here that are probably very familiar with us, um, but I think this quote from Wendell Berry does a really great job of sort of capturing what we're all about, and that's do unto those downstreams as you would do, as you would have those upstream do unto you, right? And I think a lot of us can probably recognize that um, from our own religious backgrounds and our own religious teachings is treat people how you want to be treated. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that we all live in a shared watershed, right? And watershed, when it rains, all of the water that's coming down in our various communities, whether we live in Salisbury, Maryland, where I am, Frederick, Maryland, uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, when it rains in those areas, it's heading into our local tributaries and it's heading into the Chesapeake Bay. And, and over time, you know, we've changed the way that the landscape looks and works and how that water runs off. Um, and so Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake, what we're all about is, is helping congregations, faith communities um, tie to their faith and understand, help, help them understand ways that working to improve our environment is not just something for environmental purposes, but also something that's good stewardship from our religious perspectives as well. Um, and helping congregations take meaningful action towards that. And in that role, we really play a role of a translator and a connector. So what that means is there's a lot of, we, we are really blessed to live in the Chesapeake region where there are a lot of environmental nonprofits. There's a lot of tremendous work going on to the Chesapeake Bay to restore it. Um, but the language that's used in that isn't always language that resonates and clicks with our faith communities, even though a lot of times we're talking about the same thing. Um, and so we do a lot of translation between the wonderful work that's going on in the restoration field to try to identify ways that we can take that message to our faith communities, help faith communities understand what's going on and help tie what's going on into their own, their own beliefs. Um, we also work with local governments because governments are a key partner in that restoration process. There's a lot of initiatives being led by our local governments that congregations can participate in. Um, and then lastly, but certainly not least, is our environmental partners, which we'll hear from a a couple of our environmental partners, we'll actually hear from local government and our environmental partners with our speakers this afternoon. Um, IPC looks to, to raise everybody's ship. And so, you know, we're not looking to replicate what all of the wonderful work that's going on in the Chesapeake. We want to connect faith communities with that and bring faith communities to the work that's going on. And so we work with um, partners throughout the regions um, where we're operating in the One Water Partnership to connect with those existing groups. Um, so here's some of our staff here at Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake. Um, we have a, a, a wonderful team that is continuing to grow. Um, and so, you know, I definitely would encourage you to hop onto our uh, website and you can check us out if you want to get in contact with any of us. Um, and I did want to talk just a little bit about the One Water Partnership too. Um, as I mentioned, this is a program of Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake. 
The goal of the One Water Partnership Program is really to engage congregations in environmental education and environmental restoration work. And so in each of what we call our hubs where we're operating, which is Anne Arundel County, Baltimore City and County, Hartford County, Howard County, and then we're operating down here in the Lower Eastern Shore, um, where we had just um, been operating in Wicomico, we're expanding into Dorchester, Somerset, and Worcester counties as well. Um, so we're really excited to be bringing that. And then also up in Pennsylvania, we're, we're working in Lancaster County. And so what the One Water Partnership does is it really formalizes that relationship between local governments, um, local nonprofit organizations and congregations in ways that we can manifest towards projects for congregations and educational opportunities, which we'll hear a little bit about tonight um, with some of the work that the Lower Shore Land Trust is doing. Um, so as I mentioned, this is part of a whole series of events. So tonight's program is um, session two of four for our Chesapeake Conversations. Our goal with these Chesapeake Conversations was to offer opportunities, as I mentioned, to learn what's going on in our various One Water Partnership hubs, hopefully inspire some of you towards action that you can take both at your congregations and at home. Um, and then the other thing that we really want to do is offer some opportunities for collaboration. So this year, our staff played a really heavy role in planning these out, but we'd love to get some volunteer participation um, from our hubs, from our, from our congregations in planning this for next year. And so at the end of the event, we'll be sending out a survey. And if you're interested in joining us in a planning committee for next year's Chesapeake Conversations, which we imagine will be the same um, format, we'll be hosting one per month from January through April, you know, please do um, feel free to raise your hand and, and we're really excited to work with you next year. Um, certainly not least, we also need to thank our sponsors. So for this evening, Chesapeake Bay Trust and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation were, were key sponsors. And we want to thank all the, the local governments and municipalities that make those funding possible. Definitely the city of Salisbury, um, who supports us very generously down here on the Lower Shore Hub, Hartford County, Baltimore County, um, Baltimore City, Howard County. Um, are all sponsors of the One Water Partnership Program through the Chesapeake Bay Trust. Um, and then this program is also being sponsored by our Lower Shore One Water Partnership Hub. And so we definitely wanna give a shout out to the Lower Shore Land Trust and Wicomico Environmental Trust who are two very key partners um, in what we're doing down here in the Lower Shore. <clears throat> so with that, I'd like to just take um, a brief moment um, Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake is looking to lean into um, what we preach and we have um, set a goal for, for having a land acknowledgement at the beginning of all of our programming in 2022. So I'd just like to take a moment to kind of center ourselves and, and read through this land acknowledgement. Um, and I'll read it out loud, but feel free to read along um, with me. Today, we wish to hold space for reflection on and gratitude for the land upon which we live and the local waters that support and nourish us all. We recognize that this land and these waters were stewarded by many hands who came before. For tens of thousands of years, Algonquin speaking cousins called the shores of the Chesapeake home. Although we have lost many names, we ask you to honor them for their stewardship of these ancient lands and waters. Our hearts are full of hope as we come together with honor for all of life. And with that, um, to get us started uh, officially here, I'd like to turn over the mic to Gurdip Hura, who will be sharing an opening reflection with us. So in one second, let me stop sharing my screen and I'll, I'll let Hura take the mic. Gurdip, you're on mute. No, you can hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Matt, for inviting me uh, to share the views on uh, nature, environment, and the universe from the Sikh religion point of view. And I understand that this webinar is focusing on landscaping with uh, uh, native plants. And certainly landscaping does require plants and plants require uh, land where you can grow and the, you have to have an environment so that these plants can be grown. Uh, and uh, Guru Nanak uh, is the founder of Sikh religion. Uh, 500 years ago, he founded this new religion. And this new religion, our new thought uh, is based on three pillars. One is the honest earning. Second is the meditation on his name are remembering him all the time. 
and third is the sharing. And we had the 10 prophets. They came as a human being into this world. And, but there is only one divine light went, which went from one body to 10th body. And all these prophets, they sang songs in praise of God. And all these uh, songs are sung in a proper rhythm. So we have to make sure that we use the same rhythm to sing those uh, songs in praise of God. The 10th prophet realized that after these 10 human being body uh, leave this world, then we are not going to come back. And so he composed all these, uh, he compiled all these uh, songs in a Bible or what we call as a holy book. And we call that as a holy book. And that holy book has got uh, uh, 1,430 pages. And all these uh, songs are included in that holy book. And he also told us that after he leaves this world, that we should always consider that holy book as a living guru or living prophet. And that's why we respect that book, which has got all these songs sung by these 10, ten prophets during their lifetime. So all these uh, compilation took place during the lifetime of the uh, prophets. So obviously we cannot have two types of copies of the holy book anywhere. So uh, uh, there's a one authentic uh, uh, copy which is in uh, India, and we always make a copy from that authentic uh, book, which was com which was compiled by the tenth prophet, and uh, it was written by by the tenth prophet, and we consider that as a uh, the living guru to, in today's context. So one of the song which was sung by the uh, the the uh, founder of the Sikh religion, Guru Nanak, according to him, uh, air is our guru, our teacher. Water is a father, and earth is a great mother, and then uh, Almighty God, our universal God, has created day and light. So day and light, according to him, these are two nurses in whose lap all the world is always at play. Now, as a human being, we can do either good deeds or bad deeds, and all these deeds are recorded in the court of uh, uh, court of the law of the God. According to our action, based on whether it is a good deed or bad deed, we can either be drawn closer to the God, or we can be drawn. We can be we can be moving further away from the from the God. Those who meditate on Him, those who remember on Him and follow the instruction, and what instruction God has given to us, uh, that you should have an honest earning. You should always remember him and also you should be involved in the uh, sharing. Now, these are the three pillars of the Sikh religion. And with the same token, I can say in all the religions, we do have uh, these kind of uh, concept that we have to have the honest earning. We have to have uh, the sharing. At the same time, we also have to remember the God in one way or the other. Now, we are not talking about one particular God, but we are talking about a universal God. Now, all these prophets, whether they are from the Christian side, they are coming from the Muslim side, or the Sikh, or Hindu, they are all messengers. They are all prophets. They are being sent by the universal God to spread the message of the universal God who says that you should be uh, doing the honest uh, earning and you should be remembering him all the time. And also you should be sharing or be involved in the community service. Those who meditate on his name or remember his name, they're not only going to get the respect in this world, but also they're going to get the respect when they depart, they leave this world and they go to the uh, court of law of God, where they are going, the, the soul is going to be making a presentation to the God in terms of what are the good deeds and what are the bad deeds which was done uh, when they were as a human being. So all these are uh, defined in the Sikh religion. And uh, we, we always consider that holy book, as I mentioned, as a living guru. So whenever we need to do anything, whether we are doing a special thing like wedding, birthday, or taking the, getting the name of the child, things like that, whatever new thing we are doing, we always go, go to the holy book, our living guru, take the permission. Or if I got any question regarding ego, lust, anything, any question, I go to the book and book has got the answer of all these questions. So we simply go to that particular page, read that the song, what they have uh, composed in praise of God. And that really helps us to see that we can get the answer of uh, that question. 
with that let me stop at this time and see if you guys have any question that you can ask to me and ho i hope that i can i can give the answer to your uh, to your satisfaction thank you very much matt uh, thank you and actually kudeep if you don't mind we'll, we'll pause and put um questions at the end but if anybody sure. has any questions for kudeep um about the sick faith um, hopefully, Gurdip will be able to stick around with us, and and we can do that. Um, also, if Gurdip can't stick around, we can put those in the chat, and we can definitely we know how to get a hold of Gurdip, um, yeah. and so we can connect that way. But so unfortunately, you so unfortunately, I have a class at six thirty, so I will not be okay. able. Okay. But but feel free to send email to me, or if anybody has a question right now, I can certainly answer that question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kadeep, for that reflection. And so Thanks. without further ado, um, I'd like to start our film. So um, bear with me one second, and I'll get that film going for us, and then we'll turn to our, our um, speaker. I'll be here for another 10 minutes, and then I will leave. Growing a greener world is made possible in part by the 2019 Subaru Crosstrek. Built in a zero landfill plant, so you can roam the earth with a lighter footprint. Subaru, proud sponsor of Growing a Greener World. I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. Every once in a while, we encounter a concept so intuitive that we never really give any thought on how to articulate it. A good example is all the wild creatures we enjoy in and around our yards and gardens. They're just there, right? Naturally? But stop and think about what would happen if you took away their food sources and the places they live. Well, guess what? Those animals we take for granted as just being a part of our world suddenly won't be there tomorrow. And that's exactly what's happening all across America and beyond. Part of the problem is urban sprawl and habitat destruction. In too many areas of the country, there's no place left for wildlife, but in the landscapes and gardens we ourselves create. Have you ever stopped to consider that all the food for all the animals on this planet starts with energy harnessed by plants? So choosing the right kinds of plants in our gardens is playing a bigger and more important role than ever and sustaining directly or indirectly all the animals with which we share our living spaces. But we add to the problem when we replace too many of our native plants, plants that have adapted to our surroundings over millions of years, with exotic specimens and new varieties, sometimes called alien plants, that are chosen more for aesthetics and maintenance reasons than for the role they play in the local landscape. Our love affair with non-native plants that have been purposely introduced into our surroundings threatens that delicate relationship. It's taking a significant toll on the animals, especially insects, that we depend on in our own ecosystems. And that has to change. When it comes to understanding the critical relationships between native plants and the creatures that depend on them, Doug Tallamy is right at the top. He's an award-winning author on the subject and professor at the University of Delaware, where he's also chair of the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology. 
His passion? To better understand all the ways insects interact with plants and how those interactions determine the diversity of larger animal communities. So I went to graduate school in entomology, became an entomologist, fascinated with insects, uh, and, and part of my graduate training was to learn about plant-insect interactions, how plants and insects interact. Uh, this is a huge field because there are a lot of plants and a lot of insects, and how they interact depends on uh, what is happening in the rest of the food web. And the major theme from, from all of those years of study was that most insects are host plant specialists. They adapt to the chemical defenses of particular plants. But all of Doug's theoretical academic research was about to really come home, literally, in a very concrete way. But in 2000, my wife and I moved into uh, this property here in uh, Oxford, Pennsylvania. It was overrun with, with non-native plants. We decided we would, we would uh, restore it to its some, some former state of nativeness. Uh, and in the process of doing that, I noticed, well, our local insects are not eating oriental bittersweet and autumn olive and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle. And I said, well, no surprise there. They did not co-evolve together as we learned in graduate school. Now, nobody was talking about non-native plants back then. The term invasive species didn't exist. Even though they were here, we weren't talking about them. The terms invasive, alien, non-native, and native plants are common today but they were rarely mentioned even just a generation ago. So perhaps it's no surprise that there's still a bit of confusion and disagreement about what they actually mean. Some people think, well, if it's from North America, it is native, and they'll gather plants from all over North America and put them in their garden. But what they've really done is create a, a North American plant zoo. Uh, a native plant, by my definition, is one that has uh, evolved within the context of the local food web. Now, food webs can be large, but for example, if we take blue spruce from the Rocky Mountains and plant it in Delaware, it is a long way from the ecosystem uh, within which it evolved and also the creatures that, that it evolved with. So organisms in Delaware have never seen a, a uh, blue spruce before. And even though the plant is from North America, it is not from a Delawarean ecosystem. So I like to think of native plants as uh, plants that are from within local food webs uh, that have a, an evolutionary history with the, the other plants and insects and organisms within that, that food web. Doug's not the only one working on the subject of bringing nature home. Thankfully, there are other key influencers scattered around the world helping to promote the message of creating healthy, living landscapes with a focus on indigenous plants. In fact, Rick Dark wrote the book on it, along with contributions from his friend and colleague, Doug Tallamy. While these two share a zeal for creating and protecting ecologically balanced landscapes, their approaches are quite different. Rick's rise to horticultural prominence started with a college botany course. His studies led to a 20-year career at Longwood Gardens, considered one of America's most important botanic gardens. When he left, he was curator of plants, with responsibility for over 11,000 plants in Longwood's collection. Today, Rick heads his Pennsylvania-based consulting firm focused on the design and management of living landscapes of diverse projects all around the world. But it's back home where Rick, along with his wife and co-horticulturalist Melinda Zor, get to enjoy their own living landscape that is as biologically balanced as it is beautiful. So often people say it's native if it was here before a certain time in a certain place or before certain other people arrived. So they're talking about a plant and a place and a time, but it doesn't really say anything about relationships. We know that what really matters is not just the plant being in a place for a time, but what essential relationships have evolved during its time there. So it's a plant, it's a place, it's a time, and it's long evolved essential relationships. In their own unique styles, both Rick and Doug's award-winning books take on the topics of what we can and should do to bring more life to our own home landscapes and why that's so important. Your book, Bringing Nature Home. First of all, I have to tell you, I love that title. But I also think that it probably raises a question to people that may hear that and go, well, you know, especially the suburbanites going, well, bringing nature home, I already have nature all around me. I see it everywhere. But they probably really don't, do they? 
Yeah, we have we have eliminated so much nature so fast that most people don't realize how little is left. Uh, and it's deceiving. You drive down the road, both sides of the road are wooded. You picture that going forever. It doesn't. It goes about 20 feet, and yeah. then it's some development. Um, so we've we've particularly in the east we have devastated our natural areas to the point where if we're going to have functioning ecosystems, if we're going to have biodiversity, we need to start sharing the property that we've taken. With ever shrinking natural habitats outside of our control, it's now more important than ever to make more room in our own home landscapes for the plants and trees that our native wildlife depend on. The population in the U.S. is, is growing constantly. I just read this morning actually about uh, the U.S. is going to be the fastest growing developed nation in the world shortly. We now have 320 million people. Uh, and if you look around you, we really are pretty much everywhere, either in our cities, our suburbs, our exurban habitats, which are highly developed, or our agriculture. Only 5% of the U.S. is considered relatively pristine. So we have to pay attention to the way we landscape all of those areas. So I'm encouraging people to, to think about the percentage of, of native plants that they have in the yards, the ones that are really productive and supporting life. Um, or, and you don't have to count species, think about the biomass. If you have one huge oak in your yard, you are doing a great service to your local ecosystem. Does that mean you can't have any, any non-natives? No, it, it doesn't mean that. Um, you can have a crepe myrtle as a, as a focus, focal point in, in your yard with the beautiful blooms. But when you look around your neighborhood and 80% of the plants are crepe myrtles or Bradford pears or burning bushes, and that's pretty much what it is when we measure it. About 80% of our, our woody ornamentals are, are non-native. I often say that gardens are the ultimate balancing act. Uh, if you look around this garden that we're in, it is mostly Eastern regional indigenous plants, call them natives if you want, but there are many exotics in here. While it's one thing to host exotic plants in your landscape, a common concern is if those exotic or alien plants become invasive. There's genuine concern about the, the potential detriments of an overuse of alien ornamentals. And, uh, or alien plants of any sort, really. The most obvious is that you you use a plant that uh, goes beyond the garden and uh, establish itself in a place where it takes up space that would normally have been occupied by some other plant with deep connected relationships in that local ecology. And that's this business of escape, and it's very real. 85% of our woody invasive plants are actually escapees from our garden. And we continue to, to go on plant explorations, sell them in our nurseries, exacerbating the problem. By invasive, I mean they have now left our gardens, they're penetrating the natural areas throughout the country to the point where a third of the vegetation in our natural areas is, is non-native. So that's one issue. Another issue is that the plants we put in our local landscapes have become the first trophic level. Those are the plants that are driving food webs. And if those plants are from Asia and Asian plants are poor at driving food webs, what are the consequences to other things that need to live in, in our, our neighborhoods? Now in the past we've thought, you know, humans are here, nature's someplace else, and we can do what we want without any consequences. And in the past that largely worked because there weren't that many humans. Today though, we're pretty much everywhere. We're either agriculture or we're, we're our shopping malls, our suburbs, our cities. And if we landscape those areas with plants that are not supporting food webs, or supporting them very poorly, we're going to seriously impact other, other creatures in, in our ecosystems. Why does that matter? Because it is the diversity of life in ecosystems that runs those ecosystems. As you increase the number of species in ecosystems, ecosystem function goes up. If you decrease it, ecosystem function goes down. Why do we need ecosystem function? Because ecosystems create the ecosystem services that support humans. So all of this is tied together. We can be selfish about it. We need to preserve other species right where we live for our own good. While the term ecosystem function can sound a bit intimidating, think of it in terms of the simple yet important things that allow nature to function as it was intended. For an entomologist like Doug, it always comes back to the bugs. You and I share uh, an admiration for a special author, E.O. Wilson. And he has a quote in your book about bugs. And he says, they're the little things that run the world. That is so true because they are, they are crucial to 
almost every aspect of terrestrial ecosystem function. They recycle nutrients, they pollinate our plants, um, which then sequester carbon. They're essential to, to food webs. If we were to eliminate insects from, from the earth, according to EO, humans would last about two months. Um, wow. So now we can do that experiment and see what happens, but I'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. A much less drastic experiment that Doug tried drives home just how critical it is to the entire ecosystem to have lots of native plants to attract large insect populations. I did a fun little experiment last summer. And this actually is something you can do at home where I simply counted caterpillars on July 25th and July 26th on a white oak in my yard, a black cherry in my yard. I moved to my neighbor's yard and counted them on Bradford pears and on burning bush. I counted the same amount of, or measured the same amount of vegetation and only look at the caterpillars at head height. On the white oak, I found 410 caterpillars from 19 different species. On the black cherry, I found 256 caterpillars from 12 different species. On the Bradford pear, I found one caterpillar from one species. And on the burning bush, I found four caterpillars from one species. And they were tiny little leaf miners that are too small for, for a bird to eat. Why were there not more caterpillars on Bradford pear or, or burning bush? Because there, there are chemical defenses in those plants that our local insects have not adapted to. Plant, uh, insects in, in China can eat calorie pear, that's what Bradford pear is, and, and burning bush, a species of euonymus, because they have been exposed to those chemicals for, for eons. But now that they're over here, they've only been over here, what, a hundred years? It's nothing in, in evolutionary time, and our insects have not been able to adapt to those plants. Our insects can eat the oak and the black cherry because uh, they have been in these ecosystems for uh, actually millions of years, and the insects have adapted to them. Uh, very productive plants. Now in the past, one of the reasons we chose Bradford pear and burning bush and all these other plants uh, was the fact that they were pest free. They had nothing eating them. It was a criterion we looked for. Uh, and if we're growing our plants strictly as, as decorations, that becomes an important trait. Uh, but plants are more than decorations. They're, they're essential components of, of our local ecosystems. So we now have to think about uh, how a plant looks, uh, as well as, we have to think about how it acts. What does it do? What does it function? As well as what does it, what does it look like? Most people would not object to having a beautiful oak tree in their yard. An important point, when I did that 410 caterpillar study, uh, I then stood back from that oak tree, took a picture, and there was no damage that you could see. You couldn't see one of those caterpillars. And unless a homeowner went up and carefully inspected the leaves, never would have known there were caterpillars on there. So. So a, a plant, a tree can, can support a lot of life without being defoliated. So again, if I'm a foraging bird looking for a meal that day, I would not be going to burning bush or Bradford pear. I'd be on that white oak and the black cherry. So the plants you put in your yard have a, a tremendous impact on local food webs. And yet we continue to fill our yards and landscapes with plants and trees that have little to do with promoting those vital relationships between them and wildlife. So what are the hurdles then? Because we t still tend to gravitate towards those alien ornamentals because we like that beauty and we like the fact that those plants are pest free, mm -hmm. but that's not really what we need. We need to adopt more of a philosophy of embracing the natives. Right. How are we going to do that? Right. We need to educate people that this is necessary, mm -hmm. that, that a typical homeowner's property is an important component of the local ecosystem. They, they, they can't opt out of ecosystem function anymore. They have to participate. And the way to participate is to, to bring those functional plants back to the landscape. Uh, once that message is delivered, I have found that people are very receptive and they're eager to take part in, in what is a huge conservation movement. Kind of important. Very important. So what brings life to a landscape in a way that not only promotes more vibrant wildlife habitats, but also satisfies the desires of the people living there? While plants will always be at the heart of any garden or landscape, Rick spends a lot of time studying this very topic. He suggests that rather than beginning with a set of objects, we start with a set of goals to ensure the landscapes we live in are beautifully layered, biologically diverse, and broadly functional. And the key to that 
is a focus on building layers with a simple, logical process. It begins with simply looking around your landscape and taking inventory. Look at your landscape. Do you have a canopy? What does the ground layer look like? Is it mulch or is it a richly organic accumulation in which all kinds of things live? Do you have an understory? Do you have a shrub layer? Uh, we are so often taught to approach gardens in terms of what plants you have, not what layers do you have, that we take an object-oriented approach to the landscape instead of a relationship-oriented approach. And getting back to layers means you will be thinking about relationships. It's important to bring layers back into the garden because there's so many things that depend upon special, the special nature of different layers. They are layer specialists. There are, are uh, animals and plants that really only live in the ground layer. There are others that really live in the mid-story. There are others that are only canopy dwellers. If you don't have these different things, you just simply cut out the opportunity for a lot of these, these things to live. Leave it to Rick's colleague Doug and his insatiable quest for understanding ecosystem function to identify a key missing link in the modern landscape. When uh, Doug was starting to look at relationships and where they exist, and he was looking at how many relationships were disappearing from a lot of our common ground. You go out and what you thought was the wild or nature, and in fact the layers were gone, and there was not that much living there. And so he's thinking, where can we, where can we find a new place for that to happen? And if you look at the extent of the suburbs, and you said, okay, if, if each person who has their suburban plot, if they think of themselves as living in a little bit of this new nature, they can reprise the layers, they can bring that richness back, and it really can be uh, a new definition of nature. So really the suburbs and our collective gardens become the new nature. So as you design or modify your landscape, to be a part of the new nature, think in terms of how you're building it in layers. Working from the top down, the tallest layer is always the canopy. While you don't often notice them from their showiness and flower, the autumn color of deciduous canopy trees is unsurpassed. Moreover, it's their sheer mass of wood and volume that provides sustenance, hunting and resting perches, and nesting cavities for an abundance of birds, mammals, insects, and other invertebrates. Beneath the canopy resides a multitude of smaller trees referred to as the understory tree layer. While this layer offers so many choices in size, shape, color, flower, and form, the aesthetic value to us is vast, as are the benefits to a lot of wildlife. Understory trees offer ideal density, height, food sources through flower, fruit, and seeds, and branching structure for shelter and nesting. These features and more make understory trees the only good option for many species where canopy trees are too high. Heading back down closer to earth, the shrub layer occupies space beneath the understory trees. While offering many of the same benefits, height, density, and food sources make these critical plants for attracting a diverse range of insects and other wildlife. In addition, it's perhaps the most versatile layer for design functionality in the landscape. The herbaceous layer is the lowest of the above ground layers. It also has the greatest botanical diversity of all above ground layers, simply because there are more species of these than of all woody plants. And a more diverse layer offers more shelter and cover for wildlife. An important added benefit is an overlapping sequence of blooms through the seasons, leading to a succession of ripening fruits and seeds, a staple food source for countless creatures. Finally, we have the ground layer. For most residential landscapes, the ground layer of choice is mowed turf. While it serves a purpose in the landscape, its function in ecological biodiversity is slim. In fact, mowed turf offers little to the cover, shelter, and sustenance necessary to sustain wildlife. And lastly, no yard or garden is too small to play a role in the bigger picture. Many people are concerned that the piece of property they own is actually too small to make a difference. Say, I only own a third of an acre and, and I can do what I, I, whatever I do and it's not going to help biodiversity. Uh, you know, it's true, the bigger the property, the, the more effective it will be. But your, your third of an acre is connected to your neighbors, and that's all of a sudden two thirds of an acre, which is connected to another neighbor. And even if you are a little island, uh, you're important in, in a number of, of respects. Many of these organisms move around a lot. Butterflies, for example, our friend the monarch is migrating all the way to Mexico, needs stopover points on the way. 
and birds migrate. Many of our breeding birds breed in Canada and they've got to move through our suburban and city neighborhoods to get to those, those spots and they have to stop along the way and eat. So if you have a choice between an oak tree or a ginkgo uh, as the single tree that can fit in your yard, the oak will support migrating birds during stopover, the ginkgo will not. So your little piece of, of the world actually can make a big difference even if your neighbors don't participate but talk to them so that they will. While it might seem a bit scary to think that a lot of the habitat that our native wildlife depends on for survival is rapidly going away, we can take an active role in taking some of that back, starting right in our own yards and balconies. Bringing nature home really does define our gardens as the new nature. And if you'd like more information, we have helpful links on what you can do on our website. Under the show notes for this episode, the website address, it's the same as our show name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm Joe Lample, and we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World. All right. So with that, I'd like to uh, pivot to our panel discussion. Um, hopefully you all found that as interesting as we did. Um, so um, one second, let me get our slides back up here. No, it's not presenting. Okay. So our first presenter, um, we've got three presenters for this evening. Um, our first presenter is Dr. Jarrell Singleton, aka Dr. Doug, or Dr. Bug, excuse me. Um, Dr. Um, Singleton is a PhD at UMES, was a former professor at UMES, and she's our resident entomologist. Um, she's also a member of St. Francis de Sales Green Team here in Salisbury, Maryland. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jarrell. Jarrell, feel free to take yourself off mute. Okay, uh, have you, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you fine. Okay. Hey, um, I would like to say that I totally enjoyed that film. And I just happened to find a book by Dr. Tolley uh, for the Living Landscape, which is now in my library of useful books. And he mentioned also his um, mentioning of Dr. E.O. Wilson, who passed away. Um, he was my mentor as an undergraduate uh, in North Dakota for uh, three summers. And he does ants, of course, and that was my thing. So I'm totally into ants and bugs and everything since I was a little kid. Um, and people think little kids don't get it, but kids get it. And the, the worst thing of all is to have a child afraid of things on the outside. You really don't want to have a kid afraid of things that crawl. And this is one of my, my missions in life, to have them eating weeds and playing with bugs. And so far, I've succeeded in a lot of this, and especially urban kids who are living in the inner city area, which think there's nothing that they can deal with. But there's tons of stuff. So I've, I've done this. But um, one of the things that makes this whole idea of urban um, gardens or pollinator gardens um, is that it's easy, very easy. Um, but you don't want to get too carried away. Like I got carried away last summer and I didn't have any lawn to cut, which was nice. But I had lots of butterflies and lots of beetles, especially beetles, ants, and wasps. The, I didn't have many honeybees, but I did have some. Um, so that worked out really good. And one of the things I found that helps to um, get your pollination if you have a little vegetable plot going, and I usually intersperse vegetables with flowering plants of different sorts, just because it's cool and it's helpful too. One of the things that you can do, uh, especially for members of the cucumber family, is to put a decaying plant matter between the rows or near the plants so that uh, blowflies and houseflies can do the pollination when you are low on bees and um, wasps. 
and this is very successful. They will they will uh, get pollinated, and so that's one of my favorite things to do. And uh, also, it attracts big things um, like buzzards. I love buzzards to come to the garden, and also woodchucks galore, or uh, groundhogs, woodchucks. And I had a family living in my yard and she was raising four little pups and she would come out to eat um, the material that I would leave for her. But water is essential. You've got to have water around your garden so that they won't be devastated by the rabbits or the um, woodchuck. And for them to take them away, it breaks your heart. But um, that's one of the things I do. Uh, now, let me talk more about um, the, the insects that we have around here. And these are some of the sites that um, I have, and this is just showing a guard. But um, one of the things that I found, the Xerxes Society, which is deal with butterflies and moth, I'm a member of that, and I've been in a member of that for more than 40 years. Um, I was introduced when I was a, a, a little kid, I mean, undergraduate. In, in North Dakota. and But I grew up in Arkansas where we got bugs, bugs galore, and that was really good um, because it didn't taint me against bugs. So um, that's one of the things that I, I do. Now, let's can we see the next slide? Um, okay, yeah, this is an uh, example of what would be a perfect little garden. And it looks like um, a lot of pollinators, you got different heights because insects actually feed at different heights on plants. And also you're gonna have many uh, smaller, um, not so cute things such as uh, the wasp and uh, millipedes, um, or oh, what is it, earwigs and other things that will also be here. So you don't wanna block your landscape so that you don't have this. And try, if you have neighbors that are real uh, roundup happy, you gotta talk to them because my neighbor on one side was round up happy and he ended up killing all of my uh, newly planted uh, you know, bulbs. I didn't tell him that I didn't use uh, pesticide. I didn't use herbicide, no her her pesticide because it's not worth your time. So I just simply let things go a uh, while. Uh, and one neighbor was upset of course because my tree was blossoming and there was everything was having a, a picnic on it. He didn't want that. He wanted to cut it. So in the night, he cut my tree. And I'm like, oh, no. But I didn't do anything but tell him that was not a good idea. So he moved anyway. So next slide. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a very common um, uh, bumblebees. And this year was great for bumblebees. There are many, 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 many species. I just got a new book on uh, the wasp and uh, of, of this area. There's so many misunderstood wasps. One of the uh, most mm, misunderstood are the parasitoids. These are wasps that uh, put eggs inside, um, mm, what do you call it? Japanese beetle larvae, a green, um, there's a green June bug lar larvae. These are beautiful. I love Cotinus. It's just beautiful. But what they do is actually put a, a larvae inside that will eat them up from inside out. But people see this massive wasp. They're so beautiful that they want to spray because they're wasps. They don't even sting. So they're not even, you know, you say, oh, why do you want to? He doesn't sting. So leave him alone. And that's one of the things that people have to get accustomed to seeing these things. Next. This is an example of a fly. This is not a, a bee. And you can tell it's a fly uh, because the way the eyes are positioned on the head and it only has two wings and not four. These are a lot of the surfeit flies they're called. And they have babies that live in yuck, yuck, mucky water with a, uh, a little tail coming out, which is a, a breathing tube. And this is what they live in. And then we, we have, um, Another insect that lives in wet lawns, and this is the, uh, people call it leather jacket, or I call them uh, the crane flies. And they are really big crane flies. They're little ones and big ones. People call them mosquito hawks 
They are not mosquito hawks. They don't even feed when they are grown ups. They just sort of mate and die. That's it. But this is another one of our many uh, things we have uh, misconceptions of. So flies do a lot of pollination. Next. And then, of course, butterflies. I had to get this because this is the uh, blue lettuce plant, which is an asteraceae. Uh, the asters form the best plants ever for most insects to feed on, and they are long lasting. This is a late fall when the uh, monarchs are coming through. Monarchs use many other plants besides the milkweed, the common milkweed plant, uh, to feed on to get ready to go. Um, on this long, long, we are on the Eastern Flyway for the Monarch here. And to get to go down the Sierra Nevada um, uh, Madres Mountains in Mexico. Now, another thing on the Eastern shore, in the fall of in mid-November, towards in mid-November, if you go to, um, there's a point going across Chesapeake Bay. I think it's uh, Elliott Island. I'm not really sure, but it's a place where it's lots of, of these plants and lots of um, astropelosa. You can find tons of, of uh, monarchs there. And what they do is feed so they can cross that bay and keep going. So it's awesome. It's a very beautiful sight to see. Next. And the hummingbird, and many, many species of hummingbird. The uh, green-throated is probably my favorite because they just are so ravenously hungry. And if you put um, artificial feeders out, it's okay because that way they will know and learn your area and come back every year. And they're very territorial. Next. And this is another bumblebee. There are, and they are on a milkweed. Now we have on the milkweed flower, the milkweed plant has a, two other very notable uh, insects that just depend upon them. One is the, um, there's a, bee, a beetle that is orange and black and beautiful. And then there is a true bug. And that one is same color as a monarch. Now there is some convergent evolution going on here in a way because these both are nasty tasting um, critters, just like the monarch. But it's, it's amazing that they all use the same plant, okay? So that is just in, incredibly uh, interesting about nature. Next. And this is a honeybee that has her little baskets all full of po pollen and she's going away. I, I really get annoyed when um, people do commercials like the bee that does um, with that honey Cheerio thing. Uh, they showed it a little male bee. This is not real. And I don't like it when, when they, uh, you know, do this to animals when it's not really true because it's the females in all of these cases that are the workers. And these are the ones that do all the things. They do everything except, you know, with the um, making babies for the next generation. But even in the, in the situation with um, ants, especially once they have um, made it, they usually don't mate again until you know, the new group comes up, but they don't, they're not like bees, which can have a, a male in the nest with them, but they are such incredible insects. It's, it's amazing. The bad thing about honeybees is that if they get disturbed and they sting you or sting something once, that's the, the end of their life. They pull everything out with the stinger. So that's the end of that. And now we are having an issue in some places with bees where the uh, Africanized honeybee has inbred and they have been as far up as Kansas, the last I heard. And I have a friend who's working on these out in Nevada. And he said, yeah, they moved up that far. But the problem with these, when they inbreed with the, uh, the European bee, what happens is they become more docile and they make, a lot of honey, but it's thin. And so it's not such a good marriage, but it's, it's, it'll work and keep them, uh, keep 
the species going, but the devastation of the honeybee is uh, worldwide. Next. And here's another yellow uh, bumblebee. And these are really fun. Um, they quite often will make a uh, little solitary nest, but they can be social as well, but not many, not like uh, um, honeybees or termites or um, ants, but they usually have very small uh, colonies, but they do have colonies and they're busy. And one of the earliest insects to come out to, with pollination. Next. And this is the pretty butterfly. I like these because I was surprised to find so many out here. And there was a big field out um, near where I live. And all of the edges of the field was left um, fallow. And it had nice patches of really beautiful uh, plants in it. And these guys were working it good. So that, that was a, a very happy time. <laughs> It's one of the ones you use to count in some, ah, our mice, house mice, deer mice, um, all sorts of mice. They really do a lot of pollination. And they, uh, when they, the plants are low, like they said in the, in the film, you have that low story. That's where they can do their uh, maximum amount of pollination. And they even climb trees to get the food. So it's, it's, um, it's just nature's way. Next. My favorite of all of the pollinators are the wasp. And this wasp that's on this, um, um, what is this? Thing? The yellow plant here, Solidago, that is the plant, yes, that is the plant, the wasp that um, people mistakenly spray for because they think it's a bad thing. It's not, it's a parasite toy. So it's the one that gets this, um, uh, the Japanese beetle and the Cotinus baby uh, when they're little babies in the lawn. You'll see them flying over the lawn. The uh, brown wasps and all the rest, every wasp that I know will go for uh, pollination, especially during the fall when plants uh, are getting all um, decomposing. Then you will see a lot, lots more insects that depend upon the smell of the alcohol, but they'll they'll be around the whole year. Next, ah, uh, the bats. We have bats here. This is one taken from the desert region, but we are we are normal bats. We have the least pipistrel here, and the brown bat, and they can do a good number on pollination and especially when they're out trying to feed uh, in the evening and some plants open in the evening and so they therefore they will get a chance to uh, get in on the action but they're real cool and we got lots of bats here and a lot of people get all weirded out by bats and thinking of uh, them sucking your blood or or something weird like um what, what is it going to give you raised bees and all? Yes, they have raised bees, but it's not something that they're going to say, oh, I'm going to give you some rabies. No, it's not going to be like that at all. It's just would be um, if you trap an animal, my whole thing is don't molest anything. Don't pick up anything with your hands. No bugs by any means possible. Do not pick them up with your hands. And I've been doing this since I was a kid and I learned very early. No, that's not something you do. And of course we have the lizards. This is a tropical one, but we do have some skinks here. And we have, um, they do feed on things, but not in a big way. Okay, any questions? Let's tell you what, if we can, we're gonna pause on the questions and we'll do the questions all at the end. So, oh, okay. so if we can, we'll pivot to our next speaker, which is Alyssa Hastings. She's with the city of Salisbury. Um, Alyssa just recently piloted through a new ordinance in the city of Salisbury. It used to be against city ordinance to, to have pollinator meadows. Um, Alyssa worked with the city of Salisbury and helped steer through some legislation that now lets um, pocket meadows is something that's acceptable under city law and ordinances. Um, so Alyssa, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. And thank you all. It's, it's great to be with you. Um, I've been a big supporter of Interfaith Partners and, and had the opportunity to work with Matt these past few years. So i um, happy to be here tonight. So just to introduce myself, I'm Al Al Alyssa Hastings. I'm a sustainability specialist for the city of Salisbury. Um, I've been in my position about uh, a little bit under three years. Um, I'm the only sustainability um, uh, exclusive position that I know of on the Eastern Shore. So it's um, very cool to be able to be in this position. Um, the we ha I have to say we've got a, a very environmentally minded mayor and um, supportive council. So those are some um, great partners that I have that are helping me um, you know, make our city more sustainable. So in my work, I'm thinking a lot about our energy use. I'm thinking about our transportation. I'm thinking about um, biodiversity and our, our habitat and our public parks and spaces. Um, it's really a very large and broad um, job that I kind of have my hands in a lot of different topics. Um, but we were, we began thinking a lot about pollinators um, back in 2017, we became certified as a bee city. Um, and that is a commitment that we made to not spray any pesticides um, on any of our parks and public spaces. Um, so that sort of kicked us off into thinking more about pollinator habitat and what we could do. Um, and since then, we've worked with the Salisbury Zoo each year to host a pollinator um, festival um, in the zoo. And, and through our certification, we, we talk about that, um, as well as to expand pollinator habitat in our parks. We actually created a new um, uh, edible garden downtown in downtown Salisbury, um, where we planted milkweed and lots of other um, native species, um, along with vegetables and fruits and herbs, um, to be able to just create um, edible landscaping and native 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 habitat um, in more of our our urban um, environment. So. Um, I read um, Doug Tallamy's book, um, Nature's Best Hope, last summer, and I got really inspired by, um, by what he was talking about with what we could do in our individual yards. So I started thinking a lot about, um, you know, my, I've, we've, my husband and I have been going through this process of planting native plants so for the past few years. We um, always buy plants through the um, Lower Shore Land Trust native plant sale down here. Um, so I've, I've been sort of exploring this on my own yard for the for the last few years, but um, did some research and it turned out that the city actually had um, basically a property maintenance code that didn't really allow for people to plant pocket pollinator meadows in their yard. Um, and so I and, and Doug in the video talked about trees and, and you know, there's so many ways to do um, native landscaping, but one of the ways is to think about removing your grass and actually planting um, native plants and planting um, a, a meadow or, you know, a, a you know, smaller size meadow. Um, so I thought this was a really interesting idea. And um, I thought, you know, the city, we really shouldn't be having any rules or, um, you know, or ordinances that are preventing this from happening. Um, so I um, started to work, um, got the support of the administration and our green team, which is our, you know, internal or our, our group of um, community members that are helping to advise us to be on sustainability issues. Um, and we said, all right, let's 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 change that. Let's allow people to do um, pocket pollinator meadows in the city. Um, so I started, that was last summer um, that we started this process. And um, I had a lot of conversations with our code enforcement folks because they're concerned, they were concerned about, you know, people complaining about other people's yards. Um, you know, just, they get calls about various things. Um, most of their, most of their calls are, a neighbor calling on another neighbor about something, whatever it is. Um, so they were really concerned about just, they were open to the idea, but they wanted to make sure that this wasn't gonna open up a floodgate of complaints or anything like that, that they would then have to deal with. Um, and so we we wrote the ordinance very, um, very thoughtfully to make sure that their um, considerations were, were um, kept. And we decided to actually make it so that um, it was very clear in the ordinance that you had that this had to be well maintained. So it wasn't going to be people who just decided to not um, cut their lawn. Like they could, you know, we didn't want people to just 
um, keep the grass that they have and just let their grass grow. That was very different than a pollinator meadow. Um, so, so we wrote like a very strategic um, and thoughtful language. We looked at other examples from across the country. Minnesota has been um, leading in a lot of this type of work um, actually, which is interesting. Um, so we worked with Lower Shore Land Trust actually, which I know you'll hear from Kate next about, um, they looked at our language and like thought helped think it through with us. Um, and, and then we put it to council um, and it was very supportive. Um, it was um, unanimously supported by our council. Um, they really liked the idea that we would have people um, register their yards. And so that way it wouldn't be any cost to the residents, but we wanted to make sure that we were getting ahead of any um, complaints that people may have, or maybe people just didn't understand why these yards were looking a little bit different than what they were used to. Um, so we created a program where we created an online form so people could just go to our city website. If you wanted to have a pollinator meadow in your yard, you just fill out the form that goes to the city. We come out, just take a look, make sure everything looks good and that you're not just neglecting your yard. Um, and, and then you'll be registered. So um, I'm very, I'm very excited. Now we're in our first year of this program, I'll, I'll say. So um, pollinator meadows take you know, it can take a few years to get started. It takes a lot of planning and thinking about. So um, we're, we officially passed the ordinance um, in October. And so this is sort of the first spring that people are preparing their yards to do this. Um, I'm working with um, local master gardeners to help provide some resources for people who wanted to do um, pollinator meadows because it can be a daunting um, task for people who don't know, you know, how to get started. Um, but, but the bottom line is um, elected officials and people in municipal government, oftentimes um, they want to do the right thing. They just don't know about whatever the, they may just not have, this may not have been a, a thought that crossed their mind before. And so like whether it's working with your local green team or working with your congregation or working with whatever group, like I would, I would definitely recommend going to them, talking about what you'd like to see if you're a city or municipality that has a similar restriction to what Salisbury had. Um, we had no problem, you know, putting this through. And um, so I definitely encourage that. Um, yeah, and so I'll, I'll answer questions any, that anyone has, but um, we're, again, we're one year one of this program. We're looking forward to getting some yard certified, taking some pictures, posting them on social media, having some demonstration yards in our community that we can point to. Um, and I, I think this will be really good for just overall biodiversity in our community. So thank you so much for um, allowing me to present. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Yeah. I think we're going to have a few congregations down here in Salisbury, too, participating in the program. I know Jarrell's really excited to get her hands in the dirt over at St. Francis, so I anticipate that being one of the early uh, early gardens for the program. Um, all right, with that, can I, um, I'm going to turn it over to Kate Patton. Kate is one of our One Water Partnership. She's the Executive Director of the Lower Shore Land Trust, which is one of our key partners down here on the Lower Shore through the One Water Partnership. So go ahead, Kate. I'll let you take it away, and I'll start sharing screen here, so I'll have your slides okay. up. Well, thank you so much, Matt, and everyone for inviting me to speak. We've had um, heard some great information tonight. And I also know that Alyssa has a wonderful garden. Um, so I plan to talk a little bit about the pollinator work that the Lower Shore Land Trust has done to support um, habitat and native plants and how we can, how we've been part of the One Water Partnership. Um, next slide. Great, so our mission at the Lower Shore Land Trust is to protect and restore natural resources, wildlife habitat and working lands to support and connect healthy and vibrant communities. We were established in 1990 and really worked on the larger landscape level conservation. The organization though began to look at how we could engage the community uh, with uh, more at large. And um, after a strategic planning process in 2014, we adopted a community ethic to expand our outreach efforts. Um, we've had a strong focus on pollinators, which began with our native plant cell way back in 2007, which has gotten stronger every year. This event though has grown um, and it's more of about programming now and education and doing events like this to get people like yourselves and folks at um, the congregations 
um, to uh, understand more about what conservation landscaping is and how they can do the small scale restoration on their own properties. So in 2019, we joined the One Water Partnership and launched this Wicomico Hub, um, which has been a really exciting project. Um, our pollinator program though, thanks um, Matt, apart from um, the One Water Partnership was established um, prior to our involvement in that. And as you can see, we really wanted to promote this healthy habitat. Um, for the suburban area. So like many of you, I'm sure I've been so inspired by Doug Tallamy. I mean, he's kind of the guru that many of us have said, wow. And it was about 15 years ago that he came and spoke to us. And we had a, a small group at the Ward Museum in Salisbury um, and just so inspired. We were ultimately able at the Lower Shoreland Trust to get this um, certification program together. And um, we really got that, uh, let's see, 2019 got that, 2017 got that going. And then in 2020, we established an agricultural certification program. Um, and they provide opportunities to pr promote this healthy and productive habitat, to share information across the network and to increase this understanding. Next slide. Thanks. So the benefits are really um, partially in the signage. You know, you go uh, walking by your neighbor's yard and you see a little sign in there and it makes you ask questions and have a conversation. Um, there's this awareness and education of others. Um, yes, you're improving habitat and um, hopefully we're getting more pollinators in our yard. Now, we know that there are similar programs around the country. Um, the National Wildlife Federation has a wonderful um, wildlife habitat program, and they've got great resources on their website. The Maryland Cooperative Extension offers home and garden information, um, and the Master Gardeners and the Baywise program are just um, incredible resources that we all can try to take advantage of. Um, but for the Lower Shore Land Trust, you know, we saw an opportunity here to do a certified program um, that we could work on a local level and get people involved locally and sharing information. So we're, um, just to kind of add on to what Alyssa was saying, we're also seeing that a number of our towns and cities are becoming certified as bee friendly. And while Alyssa shared one of the examples in Salisbury, we were also involved in the town of Berlin's efforts to become a bee friendly certified town. And um, it's interesting because each town develops their own um, process and certification and guidelines. So um, it really does uh, reflect what the community values are. And um, it's a, a great way to raise education. Uh, next slide. So this is our example of our brochure for the Certified Pollinator Program. And um, we really look at utilizing the best practices when we put this together. Um, food sources, water source, the cover source, you know, this is going against, uh, going around talking about the layers that Doug Tallamy talked about earlier and that um, Jarrell showed us, you know, when you have those great landscapes that have lots of height in them. Um, that's really good for your pollinators and um, other insects. So the, um, and then conservation practices that you can include on your property. Um, so that was what we started in 2017. And we are um, growing that every year, the more energy we put into it, obviously the more people that are excited. I think we've got between two and three dozen folks that are involved in our program um, right now. And let's see, next slide. And um, we work with a lot of the larger landscape folks and we realized that maybe we should have a different program for them. Um, so the Agricultural Cert Pollinator Certification Program, um, we know there's different tools for landowners and farmers, um, including the USDA cost share programs, wildlife incentive programs, and even some grant programs that support efforts to um, implement projects. So um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Suzanne Ketchum, she's on the call here. Um, she is our stewardship manager and the technical support for the Wicomico Hub. Um, she's really put together some great resources for the congregational properties. 
um, and others. So about installing meadows or strips on their on their properties. Um, and I also have her here because if anyone has questions that could stump me, I might ask her. Um, next, so next slide. So not all meadows can be large landscape levels. And what we do in our own backyards and in public spaces and on our congregational lands can provide the connectivity for that hidden web of life and sustain the threatened insects, the birds, um, and under other wildlife. So this is where we get to what we can all do ourselves. And as Doug Tallamy and others um, so eloquently stated, our backyards don't need to be void of life. And in fact, I think it's our responsibility to make sure that they're not. Um, next slide. So um, Saint, uh, the pollinator habitat that we've been working on at St. Albans Episcopal Church is our first project within the Wicomico Hub. And we're really looking forward to a ribbon cutting in June. So um, this in this one uh, with St. Albans, we work to first establish a um, an interested group did a rain barrel workshop, um, identified their interests, and they realized that they wanted to do this um, pollinator meadow. So we spent um, during this the last couple of years, which has been challenging, some time doing the planning and design work and began the installation. Um, and that's been going on. Um, and we're going to be excited to see some flowers in that this year. Um, next slide. Um, so really we put a lot of, of effort into the site preparation and weeds we know can be a really significant issue, especially when um, things are getting started um, and especially on these larger projects. So we found um, a lot of our mentors recommended that they get treated with herbicides. Um, and we know a lot of folks don't like to use herbicides. So we've looked at it for a couple of different ways. Um, some of our partners have had a lot of success using weed barriers. That's a lot longer of a project. You could put a weed bar barrier down in the fall, um, and then it's going to be about a year before you're ready to plant your seeds. Um, so again, you got to take into consideration. With St. Albans, we worked with herbicide application in the fall and the spring to prepare the site for planting. And then we used a wildflower mix without grasses. Um, which will allow us then to treat for um, grasses um, if needed. Next slide. Um, I saw that um, at least one of the um, congregants from St. Peter's was on um, the call earlier. Um, we really loved working with them. This was an exciting project. You can see Matt Heim standing there during the uh, dedication. They're standing on pervious um, pavers. So it was exciting to see that St. Uh, Peter's removed their parking area to um, address stormwater issues. And the city of Salisbury was huge in, that, in the support of that as well. But behind Matt is an area that's a native garden. Um, it gets a lot of shade. So we worked with, um, with St. Peter's to identify uh, plants that would be mostly shade tolerant. And we dedicated that garden uh, last year as a native plant garden in our certification program. Uh, next uh, slide. Oh, and just in terms of that St. Peter's, the other thing about that is they're located right in downtown Salisbury. So it's a wonderful focal point um, for training and as a demonstration site in the downtown area. I know this um, chart is hard to um, read, so you can find it um, on our website. And I think uh, Suzanne has put the um, link into the uh, chat. But what's really important, whether you're planting a small garden uh, on the side of your house or a large meadow, is to think about the bloom um, opportunities. Having something blooming from the beginning of the growing season to the end of the growing season is going to provide that food for as many pollinators as possible. Um, and it'll give you something beautiful to look at throughout the season. Uh, let's see, next slide. 
So in the um, first growing season, if you're working um, on a large scale, you know, you're going to be concerned about weeds, um, but you're also going to be concerned in the smaller scale. <laughs> so this is our garden looking beautiful uh, at next door to the Lower Shore Land Trust office in Snow Hill. Well, and let me tell you, weeds can be really challenging on small areas too. Um, and so this is something that you don't want to enter into um, without that thought and to consider how you're going to care for it, what types of plants are gonna be supportive of each other to help suppress the weeds, mulching where possible, um, and looking at what kinds of um, tools you have to make sure that your garden's gonna continue to look beautiful. And this is really important because when you're in a public area like Snow Hill, where we get a lot of foot traffic and people are interested, we wanna be able to share that information and, and show folks that gardens change throughout the year. They look different. Um, sometimes they're a little bit unruly and um, be able to share information so that we're inspiring people to try something in their own yards. Let's see, we're almost done here. Next slide is, again, each site is unique um, to take into consideration what you want to achieve on your site, um, knowing that these projects could take quite a bit of time. Um, I think we've heard some folks reference it could take two or three years to get established. Um, it's a, an experience, um, a constant learning process, uh, especially when installing, a, a, as I said, a garden in a town or a public space where you're going to want to have ongoing education. We have an interpretive sign there. And um, when it takes two or three uh, years to look like a meadow, it's important to remember that the site is still providing um, benefits to pollinators and water quality. So whether you're working on a site, a project with your congregation, um, a neighborhood park or your own backyard, um, the work that our gardens gives us is always an opportunity to provide some good stewardship um, to the natural resources around us. And um, final slide is um, some resources that I found. I'm new to podcasting and um, the Joe Gardner that introduced Doug Tallamy has a series of amazing uh, pod podcasts. He's got a great one on uh, starting a meadow if you're interested in that. We have um, also read a book by uh, Kim Ironman, The Pollinator Victory Garden. You know, I think she carries the torch that Doug Tallamy talks about, which, you know, it's really up to all of us. If we're going to that pollinator victory garden, if we're going to keep um, that food web alive, we want to all do our part. Um, and um, we're also members of the Maryland Native Plant Society, so you can get some great resources there. Um, so thank you very much and um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Kate, and thank you to all of our speakers for joining us. So we have reached the question and answer period. So um, feel free if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask. Um, we've got about 57 people on the call, so it might be good if you use the raise the hand function, but it's also okay if you want to just take yourself on mute. Let's just try to be respectful of everyone else. Um, and I'll be monitoring the chat too, so we'll, we'll open it up to questions. This is great, Matt, because you got me all worried that they're going to really, you know, quiz us at the end. I thought, yeah, this, this is usually a talking group. Matt, I, I think, think, I think, think Richard has a question. Go ahead, Richard. You're on mute there. Uh, Richard, you're on, you're on mute. We can't hear you. That should be it. There you go. Go okay, ahead. good. I am brand new. This is my first time Zooming and uh, first time uh, sitting in on this particular meeting. Uh, my name is Richard and I live uh, in Jarrettsville, Maryland. And I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is, I, there was no mention on mason bees at all. Is there a reason why that is not to be considered for pollinators? See, that sounds like a Jarrell question. We'll let Dr. Dr. Bug take that one. 
one of the things um, why I didn't, um, I, I wasn't going for specific groups, but there are the uh, there are so many different insects that do this that it's almost um, impossible just to lingle them out one by one. But they are very important as pollinators, especially uh, when you, well, and one way to deal with um, rotting vegetation and fungi. And we all know that the fungus rule the world and doesn't matter how many other organisms we have, it all boils down to fungus. And I love my fungus, but but it's still uh, that's one of the things too. So they may e end up uh, eating uh, fungus as well. These these particular bees. So therefore, because um, there are ants that grow fungus just for eating. So that's one of the reasons I didn't single them. Oh, okay, I I tried to follow all of the directions online, trying to set them out and getting the tubes out right and making sure yes. they had access to a big fat dish of uh, mud for them. And yes. uh, they seemed to come out before the flowers uh, were, were blooming. And I'm trying to figure where are they not getting, or where are they getting uh, the pollen if there's no flowers in that general area? So I don't know whether I have typical flowers that most people have regarding uh, trying to draw uh, the hummingbirds and uh, butterflies and other insects, but they didn't seem to, you know, to respond to that. And I didn't want to give up on that. So I don't know whether I should try again and perhaps try different varieties of uh, flowers that might uh, bloom earlier or produce, uh, you know, pollen for them. Uh, yes, I would, would suggest that, but they may not be uh, subsiding straight on the fungus, on the on flowers, like I said, many um, any bees and wasps in, in in that whole hymenopteran group will use fungus. Okay, well, that's something I didn't realize, and I thought that was a good idea with the uh, the, cu the cucumbers and putting out uh, rotted uh, right <laughs> root and vegetables because there's always insects coming to it. If you if they get to your garbage pail, I'm sure they'll find something in the garden too. To, uh, to right, absolutely. To yeah, so, hey. Thank you, Richard. That was, that was a great question. I did. Um, I see we've got one question in the chat. Um, I'm wondering if there's anyone has some experience um, blending pollinator outreach with food um, in backyards. I know, Jarrell, you mentioned mixing your vegetable garden with pollinators. Um, it sounds like this is coming from the Baltimore area. There's a lot of food deserts here in Baltimore, and it seems like a good opportunity to mix um, community gardens with pollinators. They definitely go hand in hand. I can. I used to manage a network of community gardens in Memphis, Tennessee, and I'll say we used to have a lot of pollinators mixed in with our vegetables as well. Uh, well yeah, that is a very workable um, solution, especially you get to both of two worlds. And uh, many of your um, food plants, uh, they're, they're in the same family as our, you know, ornamentals, so to speak. But as far as I'm concerned, all of them can be food plants, even down to a marigold. If you get you get really serious, you can, you know, munch away at a marigold. Um, all the weeds are there to me. I, I heard um, Kate talking about weeds. I don't think I don't think there are such things as weeds. Uh, weeds are just plants where you don't want them to be, but they still have an incredible function as foods for pollinators and others. So to me, there are no weeds. <laughs> well, I'll have to say for me, you can take your, your muted glass. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I think as, as a friend of mine in the Maryland Extension says, you know, weeds are just um, plants without a good press um, contact or press agent. But I was just also thinking about the answer to that question is um, the Maryland Extension Grow It, Eat It program um, might be helpful. Um, you know, we work with the 4-H folks and they like to volunteer in our garden and do some of that weeding. And maybe we'll just move some of those weeds to a better location, Jarell. Um, <laughs> But I think that um, opportunities to grow some of the important pollinator plants with um, some of the native um, 
uh, or grow the pollinator plants with some of the vegetables is really important because, you know, my garden always does better when I have those plants um, growing, you know, the, that are attracting the, the bugs and the pollinators. So um, looking for those opportunities is really important. Right, I agree. Also jump in and say that um, the, the edible garden downtown that I was talking about, that whole concept was um, started because we, we our mayor became really interested in this um, TED talk that he watched um, where a community in England was just planting blueberries and just all these edible plants is landscaping like wherever um in medians in you know in front of businesses in all these different spaces and it was simultaneously to improve um, education about where your food comes from but also just increase access to food you know in their community why are we planting boxwood um, bushes when we could plant blueberries you know with these kinds of questions um, and i'll just add that um I'd love to see more of that all throughout the city. Um, the maintenance is just, you know, part of part of the the challenge there. Um, but even in that in the edible garden, which is only three raised beds, it's not a very very large garden. That middle bed we planted herbs and pollinator um, plants like milkweed and others. And I last summer saw monarch butterflies visiting that garden, which was really cool. Um, it kind of just goes to show what what Doug was saying about even very small spaces can be great habitat. Um, so I love the idea of combining food um, and, and pollinators together. I think that's definitely gonna be, um, continue to be more important moving forward. Thank you. It looks like Liz has a question. Go ahead, Liz. Hi, I have a question for the bug doctor. Um, I have a lot of uh, young, I've tra been transplanting some young white pines in my yard uh, because my, okay, so the perimeter has all these dying uh, Leland cypresses. And so as they come down and I get around to chopping them up, I, I've been replacing them with white pines. And last year I found a bug on my white pines that I had never seen before. And these pine trees, these little pine trees are about, I don't know, three feet tall. So they're not tiny, but I think it was a saw fly. And so my question is, and it was the caterpillars. And so my question is, what do I do to keep the saw flies from gobbling up my little young uh, white pines? Mm, one of the things that um, saw fly larvae, it uh, look very different from a caterpillar. They have their little front, they got their six little front legs and they got a separate head that's distinctively yeah. hard. Yeah, as opposed okay. to caterpillars, which tend to be a little blump, 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 you know, a little rounded. Well, these guys, um, what I normally do is I get a systemic pesticide and I usually go um, and get, this is a pesticide that doesn't hurt the plant it doesn't hurt very many things except the things that will feed on a plant. So it's taken up by the roots of the plant. And so when the little caterpillars eat, uh, Johnson's uh, seed and feed at the place where I usually get my any kind of um, work, of, the one in Salisbury, mm -hmm. how I can get my um, materials that I need if I need some pest control. That's where I usually get my, and also they have very incredible strange plants that I love to get. Um, they're local, they have some uh, curry plants, which I never thought I'd find, but they grow very well. Anyway, you can actually do that and it would save your plants um, from, you know, being destroyed because they will tear those shoots up. Yeah, I, I got one small white pine tree that I think it, may well i don't know if it'll survive the winter i guess we'll find out in a couple months but but um by the time i got out there it was chewing on the next one and right. i was told in a group to just shake them off the tree no they'll go back up yeah they won't just crawl back up so therefore the whole point is you need to stop them where they go and uh, and to me systemics work best systemics okay systemic I will, anything that they can um feed on the plant and then in turn they will uh, get the toxin okay got it thank safe. you very safe 
Thank you. All right. Well, we're about 10 minutes over, so I'm going to go ahead and hit stop on the recording here. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, I think we've had a really great um, evening with the present presenters and everybody. A special shout out to, to Kate and Dr. Bug, Jarrell, um, Pinkleton, and Alyssa for joining us. Thank you so much for all the time you put into preparing your presentations and joining us tonight. Um, as I mentioned, this is part of a series, so we will have another Chesapeake Conversations coming up in March. This will be led by our Lancaster Hub up in Pennsylvania. It'll be focused on climate change and, and avenues for faith congregations to get involved in work on climate change. So um, really excited for, it's a brand new, it's our newest hub, and really excited for them to be working together on that. So hopefully you'll come out and join us. Um, but with that, I'm going to hit, hit pause on that, and thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Good night.